Palestinians get set for Monday to present a resolution at the UN with a deadline on ending the occupation and returning to the 1967 borders. Meanwhile, a massive military parade in Gaza marks 27, since, 27 years since the founding of Hamas. Demonstrations follow Turkish police raids on a newspaper and TV station with close ties to arrival of President Tayyip Erdogan. At least 23 people are arrested. In Peru, in a historic agreement, United Nations members reach an agreement on tackling climate change to require all nations to reduce emissions. Critiques call the deal too weak. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening and welcome to the news today. The Palestinian delegation to the UN will submit a proposal tomorrow setting a two or three year timetable for Israel to withdraw to the 1967 lines. It's been a long time in the making on the heels of a major campaign for statehood by unilateral action. Israel remains firmly opposed to the move. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will meet John Kerry tomorrow to try to halt it and uh, at least until uh, our uh, the elections, the Israeli elections are over. Meanwhile, in the Gaza Strip, Hamas, which opposes such action at the UN, held a massive military parade marking 27 years of its existence and in a show of force flew a drone in the Gaza skies. But first, let's take a look back. شملت اولا التوجه الى مجلس الامن لمشروع قرار عربي يتضمن تثبيت قيام دوله فلسطين بعاصمتها القدس الشرقيه على حدود الرابع من حزيران 67 نسيون لخبط علينا بامصوت اخلاطات باوم نسيجات لكب 67 والدبر يفي את גורמי האסלאם הקיצוני לפרברי תל אביב ולליבה של ירושלים. כמה חררנע רזה, כמה עקבנע פיה סולטה, סלו קרר נפס את תגרובה פתדפה לגרביה, תמהידה לאוסמוננה אל הפלסטינים כל לפלסטינים. אבל שלא יהיה שום ספק, הדבר הזה יידחק. Yes, and this evening we will speak with analysts in London and in Gaza. And with me here in the studio on set, our senior Middle East analyst, Ali Wakid and Avi Sakhalov. Good, Good evening, evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. So let's start. Why now? Why today, Avi? How come? I must say that uh, I'm still asking myself this question of how come that suddenly they decided to approach the UN tomorrow, meaning they, they are not even waiting for the meeting between uh, John Kerry and the Ministers of Foreign Affairs of the Arab League on Tuesday, that is planned at least for, for Tuesday. I think what they're trying to do is actually to change or to affect the, the American decision to um, present an offer or to present some kind of uh, an, an idea of, of their own to the UN, to the Security Council, meaning uh, a resolution that will talk generally about the foundation of a Palestinian state, but would be much more closer to the Israeli state. And we just said that uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is supposed to meet tomorrow with John Kerry, which right. means that what? Is it like, can we say, um, as some kind of a move that the Palestinians are trying to do before Prime Minister will meet Exactly. Johnson. The Palestinians are trying to say we're not waiting for anyone, not for the Americans, for some kind of a resolution that would be in favor of the Israelis. No, of course, to Benjamin Netanyahu. We're going to the UN, all power advancing towards the recognition of a Palestinian state. I'm not that sure that it's going to work. But even if they will be vetoed by the Americans, I think that this is what they're expecting and they want to see this veto in order to say, yes, we're the patriots, we're against the, the American stand. So uh, if we're talking about uh, against the American stand from the Palestinian Fatah point of view, let's look at Hamas. Hamas also opposes to this uh, let's, unilateral move in one way or another. Why? 
Because in case of a peace uh, process, this will be the merchandise that the Palestinian public opinion will be uh, dealing with and not uh, other uh, issues, the war, the war in Gaza, the very huge victory uh, of Hamas uh, in Gaza that Hamas believe it was a very big uh, victory. The, public, the Palestinian public opinion is so willing to see a serious peace process back this time by the international community and not the Palestinian left alone to the faith with the to their destiny uh, with the uh, Israelis when the Israelis are automatically supported by the uh, Americans. This time the uh, Palestinians feel that the Israelis are not automatically supported by the Americans. And unlike uh, Avi said, I think that every Palestinian step is well and deeply coordinated with the uh, American. And this is not an accident. This is not a mistake that the Palestinians are tomorrow. At the same time that uh, uh, John Kerry will be uh, meeting uh, Netanyahu and urging him to accept a, a serious uh, peace process, serious peace process established on an Israeli recognition of the 1967 borders with some corrections of borders, plus a calendar. And even if the calendar will not be uh, uh, published, even the calendar will not be uh, declared, that the base of uh, 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 managing the conflict will be putting aside for so solving uh, the conflict. And this is the main effort of the uh, Palestinian Authority, backed by the uh, international community. There is an initiative that at the last minute can replace the Palestinian initiative, okay. and it is a European initiative led by France, coordinated with Great Britain and, German, uh, and Germany. And this says that the, the deadline that the Palestinian will mention in their initiative of two or three years will be uh, uh, replaced by not uh, another uh, deadline, but the end of the negotiations and not an agreement. This is the semantic uh, semantical difference. From what you're saying, for why, what I can understand, the subtext is that someone is trying to pressure Benjamin Netanyahu before the Israeli elections uh, that are coming, maybe it can work in the benefit of Benjamin Netanyahu to do something before the election. It can help him uh, maybe during his campaign before you will answer this. Let's see more on the same subject from Shai Ben-Ari. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is set to meet Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Rome Monday, with ongoing tensions between Israel and the Palestinian Authority on the agenda. The parley is expected to focus on a Palestinian UN initiative, which will be presented to the Security Council perhaps before the end of the year, and is meant to set a time frame for ending the occupation of the West Bank with or without a peace deal. The initiative represents a diplomatic headache for the Obama administration, which is coming under heavy pressure to this time refrain from using its nearly traditional pro-Israeli veto. We also stand against the possibility of a diplomatic assault. That is to say, an attempt to force upon us, through UN resolutions, withdrawals to the 1967 borders within a defined time frame of two years. This will bring the radical elements to the suburbs of Tel Aviv and to the heart of Jerusalem. We will not allow this. Kerry may try to work out a compromise which could be more acceptable to Israel. One of the options is a French proposal which also sets a time frame but refers to a final resolution of the conflict and not to the end of occupation. Any unilateral action does not advance an agreement between us and the Palestinians, but only distances one. The State Department noted Kerry would likely be speaking with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas as well in the coming days, not ruling out a possible meeting between the two. In any case, following the meeting with Netanyahu, Kerry will meet on Tuesday in London with Palestinian representatives as well as Arab foreign ministers who have been pressuring the U.S. to support the Palestinian initiative, or at least avoid vetoing it. Many in Israel expect that a historic U.S. decision to refrain from a veto could help Prime Minister Netanyahu in the polls, though such a development could also be spun by the center-left parties as a diplomatic failure on his part. If the U.S. does decide to strike down the Palestinian initiative, this could complicate the White House's relations with the Arab states, which have gained critical importance recently in the context of the struggle with the Islamic State. Another option would be for Kerry to suggest a proposal unacceptable to both sides, thus at least remaining neutral. The decision made by Washington in this regard is likely to have a lasting effect on realities in the Middle East for the foreseeable future. So we just uh, spoke about uh, Benjamin uh, uh, Netanyahu, that maybe these, this kind of a move and this kind of pressure from uh, John Kerry, the United States, uh, let's say the European uh, community, can actually work in the benefit of Benjamin Netanyahu.
at the end. I don't see that coming. You don't see I, that. I think that any move right now in the UN, in the Security Council, will not benefit for Benjamin Netanyahu. I think that he will be under pressure. I think that he will need to react as someone who's a, the major candidate to be the next prime minister. He will need to show the Israeli public, yes, we are doing something in order to stop this international, with pressure. international pressure towards a recognition in the Palestinian state. Now, at the end, I don't think that the, the Israeli state or, or Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has any tools in order to fight it, at least all the time that we do not really know what will be the American position. If the American position will be completely in favor of the state of Israel, of course, yes, he gained many points. But I think that just as Ali mentioned before, I, th I suspect that the Americans are not that enthusiastic to go in favor of the state of Israel or especially Benjamin Netanyahu. Are not that enthusiastic that they will reach a point that they won't put any veto on the decision? Last week, um, the American ambassador to, uh, to Israel made it uh, clear that uh, President Obama, in spite of the Republican Congress, that he will be obliged to deal with, is still committed to launch a very serious uh, peace process yeah, he based said on also the that creation of the Yeah, he said State. to us also, just before, uh, the, before the end of the term of uh, Barack Obama, the Americans would like to do a big move, and they're not giving up yet. So. And the Americans are building their anti-terror, anti-jihad coalition. The Arab states are supposed to be an integral part of this coalition. The Arab states are making pressure in order to solve the Palestinian uh, issue so they can show to the public opinion to the Arab world that something was achieved from all these uh, but alliances. But Israel is out of this coalition. Israel is out of this coalition, but the Arab states are in this uh, coalition, and they need to be paid in order to be a part of this coalition, although one we can, can think that they are in this coalition for their favor, for their uh, interest, for the security interest, and this is uh, true, by the way. But when Jordan, when Egypt are under the danger, this region needs stability, and the peace process can be an element that can stabilize the uh, situation in the middle of this big mess that the Middle East is... Uh, uh, is living now. I, w as far as I know, the Palestinians they are not betting. They are playing with uh, states that who are paying the salaries of the Palestinian civil servants of the Palestinian security men. A Palestinian cannot go to the Security Council with such a dramatic initiative if the step was not, I don't say, got a, a green light from the Americans and from the EU, but um, at a minimum coordinated with the uh, EU and with the Americans. And and we should not uh, uh, we should not forget that they still have 24 hours to bargain with the international community, to bargain with the uh, European for the small nuances of the uh, of the initiative. So just uh, yes, L Lucy, I think that if we will follow uh, Ali's line here, and if there's some kind of a coordination between the American administration and the PA, meaning that not necessarily the the, the U.S. will veto any kind of a pro Palestinian proposal meaning that the American administration is, is revenging, a very cold revenge, a dish that is best served cold. This is their revenge for the support of Benjamin Netanyahu for the Republicans during the last elections in the U.S. I think that by supporting the Palestinians in any level, this is a very cruel revenge against Benjamin Netanyahu because that would really weaken Netanyahu's positions. Yeah, but replace the Palestinian initiative with a European uh, initiative almost at the same basis, but with a small but big difference of the deadline can be uh, something that the administration can uh, digest on one hand, and on the other hand, giving this kick to Benjamin Netanyahu. So it seems that, um, it seems that for from what we're seeing, that the Palestinians are playing the same game that uh, maybe the Israelis played for a long, long time, and they're playing in the same tools, and they're saying, okay, you know what, let's not go with the uh, violence way, let's go with the diplomatic way that you taught us. Let's go to the, to the Hamas, which is still sticking in a certain way. Just yesterday, they paid a third of the, the only third part from the salaries. From where the money came from? The money came from uh, with uh, suitcases still from the uh 
from the underground uh, empire of Hamas that was not totally that did not totally uh, disappear uh, in the war of uh, Gaza and in spite of the uh, Egyptian very uh, tough campaign against uh, a Hamas uh, infrastructure uh, in between uh, Gaza and uh, and Egypt Hamas is paid by the uh, Turkish Hamas there is the Qatari donation for the reconstruction of the uh, of the Gaza uh, uh, project oh, I thought uh, if you're going to say the reconstruction of the tunnels but <laughs> no 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 uh, <laughs> if, if they got by suitcases so and uh, but still this is the third and we when we uh, when we talk about Hamas money, uh, Lucy, there is Hamas the movement, there is Hamas the government, and there is Hamas the military wing, and we are talking about hundreds of thousands. The Hamas organic apparatus, the Hamas as a party, has also ton t thousands of employees to deal with, Hamas government and Hamas military wing. So when we are talking about a third, it's not really a third, it's less than a third. This is why in the last trials of Friday and today, Hamas is back to their very traditional Islamic radical language of all Palestine, Islamic uh, Palestine, and blessing and begging Iran to bring back its support to the uh, to Hamas Exactly at this point that you were saying that although we're talking about military wing and government and political, um, it seems that uh, today they were really united. It seems that today they send the message of the entire Palestine, of not only Gaza Strip, not only the West Bank, when Fatah is only talking about ending the occupation in uh, the West Bank. Where does it put Hamas? Hamas today is sending a totally different message to the Palestinians. Hamas is right now trying to make everything possible in order to convince the people of Gaza that they still have power, that they are still capable of reconstructing Gaza Strip. The situation right now in the Gaza Strip is the worst, I would say, for years. I mean, when you talk to people in Gaza, the economic situation, the health situation, the hospitals, the way that they look, it's terrible. And I think that many people are complaining and many, many people in Gaza are pointing a finger at Hamas. Hamas doesn't have any answer except for what we hear today. Then again, marches, military marches, saying we will win, we will conquer, we will take all of Palestine. This is the only answer that they have. Right now, if the Palestinian Authority is going to approach the UN tomorrow, they are going to steal the show from Hamas and everyone will be talking about their initiative over there and about the, the, the tools that the PA is, uh, is choosing. Look, the PA had another option of declaring the halt of the security coordination with Israel. They are still not doing that. Although Jibril Ajoub said it and although Saib Arikat said it, I still didn't hear about the new decision to completely stop the security coordination, meaning they on don't the want an escalation. Continuing. They don't want an escalation on the ground. They want a diplomatic war and not a real war. Lucy, at this angle, I want to mention the fact that Friday, when the Palestinians should commemorate the death of Ziad Abu Ain, was the, the anniversary of Hamas. So imagine why the Palestinian Authority did not go and mourn the death of, uh, of uh, Ziad Abu Ain, because allowing the people to mourn Ziad Abu Ain is allowing Hamas to go on their rallies in the West Bank, and this was a very bad timing for the Palestinian Authority that Ziad Abu Ain should, should have died at the moment that Hamas was celebrating its anniversary. But, uh, I think that bad timing is the key word for Palestinians, but uh, maybe not now. But let's see, uh, you talked about the situation in the Gaza Strip with us uh, right now uh, from Gaza is Dr. Hani Basus, political scientist uh, from uh, the Islamic University of Gaza. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Good evening. So we're just hearing here from our analyst how bad the situation, the economic situation in the Gaza Strip is and what is happening with the people in the Gaza Strip. When, on the other hand, we're seeing military parade and we're seeing Hamas talking about entire Palestine. Is this, the, are these, are the things that the Palestinians want to hear, want to hear when they don't have anything to eat on their table? Well, I think the situation is still as complicated as I did explain many times before. Yes. Uh, Gaza in, in in dire need for the basic uh, necessities like food, equipment, uh, medicines, and other needs for the people to live basic life. At the same time, we have seen the parade in the Gaza Strip by Hamas today, uh, showing the willingness to fight to the last uh, to the last second of their life. But at the same time, people in Gaza, as I said, they, they need them to live a decent life. They want to have all necessities. And I cannot even count what we have, what we need in Gaza, because what we have in Gaza is less than the minimum expectations and the minimum standard of the basic needs of a human being 
even the water we drink is not as clean as you can imagine. So um, this situation uh, in Gaza is still as bad as it is. And even the try, try, Dr. Basus, try to describe this for me. Uh, you're going to the grocery yeah. store. What do you find in the grocery store right now? Well, in terms of food, you could find them most of things in grocery, but um, basic uh, needs like service, public services, for example, when you go to a hospital, there is nothing. Uh, we have seen many patients in hospitals waiting. They cannot find medical doctors. They cannot find um, um, even basic hygiene. Um, the, we have seen staff, uh, members of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian government has not been working because they do not get salary. The electricity goes on and off, like eight hours on and eight hours off. The water in Gaza, we do not have pure water from the tap. We buy the water from different places. So these are basic needs. When you, when you talk about the infrastructure, the sewage, and the water, and other things, everything is spoiled. It's Do not the basic standard of needs for a human being. Yeah, Dr. Basus, when we're talking and we're seeing right now the current situation in Gaza Strip, and we're hearing from, from you about the current situation in the Gaza Strip, uh, on the other side, we're seeing that the PA is deciding to go to the UN Council and uh, to try to end the occupation in the West Bank. How does the people in the Gaza Strip see this move? Because they are, in one way or another, are left behind. Well, I think most people in Gaza feel... Uh, this is a kind of a step which is can be described as sarcastic. It's some something silly that the people uh, they need the basic um, necessities. You need to build the institutions for the Palestinian state. Nothing has been built. We just uh, announcing the Palestinian state statement time in 1998, 1988, in 2012. The Palestinian state was announced. This is going to be the third time which the Palestinian Authority is seeking to announce a Palestinian state, but in on the ground there is nothing at all. The Palestinian institution, the Palestinian uh, Authority, does not have an authority. The Palestinian Authority is not functioning. Uh, we are not, as Palestinians, looking for only for the term of the state without having something feasible, something realistic on the ground. And this yes. is what people are calling for, despite the fact that most people uh, um, encouraging the Palestinian Authority to go for war to the UN, but at the same time, they're calling for something feasible. Yes, uh, Dr. Basus, thank you very much uh, for this. Um, I, I, at the same time that we're talking about that this is a move, of course, uh, in front of Israel, but this is also a move, it seems, from the PA towards Hamas, because when the PA is saying, okay, we want to end the occupation in the West Bank. They're not considering the Gaza Strip. They're not talking about the Gaza Strip, which means that maybe they're trying to send, what, a message to the people, see, we are taking care of our people because we're Fatah, see what Hamas is doing in the Gaza Strip. No, I, I do not totally agree. They they do define Hudud Sabah City in the borders of uh, 67. So they, they do refer tonight at the meeting of the Palestinian leadership President Mahmoud Abbas opened his speech with saying that the main target of the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian leadership, was to rebuild Gaza Strip. Meaning, he's, he's he does Mention. try to say he's trying to say to his people in the Gaza Strip, we're still uh, worried about you. We're still trying to to make things better for you. But in a way, he knows he understands that there's no re reconciliation. That Hamas is completely completely in control over Gaza, and he doesn't have a real ability to change the situation over there. Can you change the situation in the Gaza Strip? You see, uh, a month ago, we started to talk that the Palestinians are complaining from the fact that there is uh, an unwritten agreement between Israel and the Hamas to keep the peace process stuck and to reduce the situation in Gaza only to the, to the physical part of the reconstruction and the uh, one billion or the millions that started uh, coming to the Gaza Strip from, uh, from uh, Qatar and the fact that Israel Israel are allowing hundreds of trucks to enter uh, uh, construction material to the uh, Gaza Strip. It is indirectly encouraging and strengthening and stabilizing the Hamas control of the uh, of the Gaza Strip, which the Palestinian Authority so as it is true that it is helping the people in Gaza, but is, it is helping also the Hamas to keep the status quo. And this is uh, the, the the challenge that the Palestinian Authority will be uh, uh, tr will be maneuvering in the last in the coming weeks. On on one hand, to try to convince the Palestinians, as Avi said, in the uh, Gaza Strip, that there is a reason for you maybe to uprise against uh, Hamas if this resolution will be launched and 
and if there is a, a peace process that at the end of the day will uh, create a Palestinian state and on the and on the other hand the fact that Israel will try with all the diplomatic uh, tools to prevent this uh, Palestinian uh, diplomatic campaign uh, to succeed so we just uh, asked today that Israel is on the street if uh, the current Palestinian push for a statehood had a deadline at the UN will help and deadline at the deadlines in the UN uh, will help or hurt Netanyahu let's see this is an external affairs issue. It has nothing to do with the elections. No one seems to care about these elections, actually. I think it will uh, not harm Netanyahu. I think it will even uh, give a little bit of a push, because uh, all these uh, things that the Palestinians are doing while they uh, acting, doing terror acts against Israelis, and like, like they're doing a two... One, in one hand, they're, doing, they're saying that they want peace. On the other hand, they are doing all these terror acts. I think all in all, it's uh, making people become more right-wing. Nothing will move Netanyahu from a seat. People in Israel are so stupid and drunk. There's no way they'll vote for someone else. I don't think it will hurt him. His position has already been damaged. He hasn't taken any real steps toward the Palestinians. The current proposal for Palestinian state recognition will hurt Netanyahu because it will take off from his ticket what he's trying to promote in the upcoming elections. It seems that the Israelis have their opinion on Benjamin Netanyahu more than they have their opinion on uh, what the Palestinians are going to do. Just before we're ending this segment, I want to ask you, gentlemen, if we are looking at the current situation. Israel was trusting the United States to be its safety net. And from what I'm hearing from you, it seems that the United States stopped being the safety net of Israel. Well, this is, then again, it's, it's a long story. It's a long history of, at the end of the day, a conflict or two leaders that do not really like each other. And at the end of the day, yes, it's not only about the state of Israel and the American administration. It's also about personal issues. And when an Israeli prime minister is coming to the U.S. and meeting with one of its uh, more dominant rivals of the, the American president, it says something. It sends a message. And I guess that the Americans had enough of this intervention of the, the Israelis in the American elections. Maybe, just maybe. And they are intervening in the, in the Israeli of politics. Of course. Uh, now, this is their way to revenge. This is their way to, to show Netanyahu we can do the same just like what you did. In Lucy, I'm not sure that the American will veto the Palestinian, uh, will not veto the will Palestinian veto. Uh, initiative, but if they won't, this is definitely a new era in the relations between Israel and the Americans, a new era in the situation in the, in the uh, Middle East. Yeah, it seems uh, that uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians and the Americans are uh, on the way for elections, the Palestinians, Israelis, and uh, the Americans. Like I said, gentlemen, thank you very, very much uh, for being with me thank in you. this uh, part. We're going out for a small break. We won't reach peace in the meantime, but we will see some commercials. So don't go anywhere. Two minutes and I'll be back. Palestinians get set for Monday to present a resolution at the UN with a deadline on ending the occupation and returning to 1967 borders. Meanwhile, a massive military parade in Gaza marks 27 years since the founding of Hamas. Demonstrations follow Turkish police raids on a newspaper and TV station with close ties to arrival of President Tayyip Erdogan. At least 23 people are arrested. And in Peru, in an historic agreement, United Nations members reach an agreement on tackling climate change to require all nations to reduce emissions. Critics call the deal too weak.
Welcome back. Turkish police on Sunday raided a television station and a newspaper in Istanbul arresting journalists who have been critical of the government. The arrest mark an escalation in the aggressive approach that President Tayyip Erdogan is taking with his opposers. Ayman Siksik has more on the latest developments in Turkey's fragile democracy. Turkish police raided media outlets on Sunday and detained 23 people nationwide in a government-led effort to stop so-called conspirators against the president. Journalists, television producers and police were among those detained, all of whom are considered detractors of Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The chief of one of the targeted media groups called the arrests a threat to democracy in Turkey. This is a disgrace for Turkey, and this is not a convenient picture for Turkey. In 21st century Turkey, a media group that has dozens of TV channels, radios, websites and magazines is being exposed to such a treatment. Protesters denouncing the government's actions quickly gathered outside the offices of today's Zaman, a leading paper often critical of Erdogan, to denounce the arrests, chanting, free speech cannot be silenced. The public pushback gained steam after Erdogan had pushed through legislation, boosting government control of the judiciary. Most recently, a law restructuring two top courts. We are an international media outlet. We are broadcasting in foreign countries as well, and these scenes will be marked as a disgrace in history. The criticism of Erdogan and his Justice and Development Party, or AKP, by local media prompted the attempt to suppress the voices of his opponents. Critics have recently accused Erdogan of reviving his Islamist roots, claiming the president is displaying authoritarian tendencies. Yes, and with me right now is Professor Dolz, every Middle East expert at Ben Gurion University. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. Good evening. So, uh, yeah. Professor Zevi, let's try to understand: Is it what the Turkish way of democracy? What we're seeing right now? We're watching the death of Turkish democracy, whatever there was of it. There was a there was a tendency towards democracy or a, a trend towards democracy since the late 1990s which culminated during the first uh, and second terms of this party, Erdogan's party. But uh, since around 2008 and until today, we're seeing a very quick demise of whatever there existed of this, of this uh, trend towards democracy. So uh, the, the separation of powers is dead. The army cannot function, and the media now is dying very quickly because uh, there is no criticism, there is no critique of, of Erdogan or his party allowed in the media. But is this the way to, um, let's say, to, to go to the EU, uh, EU? This is the way that Erdogan wants to put his country out there and to be part of the European nations? Obviously, this is not uh, something that the Europeans or the European we'll Union accept. likes or would accept, and they're very critical of this of this movement. But I think, on the one hand, Erdogan assumes or or thinks that there there is no chance that Turkey will join the EU in the in the uh, near future, and also I think he thinks or believes that Turkey is too vital and too important for the West in general, for Europe in particular, to to, to interfere with his policies, so he can do whatever he likes, pretty much. So explain to me, how come the people in Turkey that are seeing this current situation are still actually voted for Erdogan, although they are seeing their dream to be part of Europe are fading away? Well, it's the story that we've seen so many times before with dictators or people who become dictators, people who become totalitarian uh, um, um, rulers you have a very populist uh, type of speech that Erdogan uses, accusing forces on the outside, accusing some, some dark lobbies, uh, hinting that they may be, that Israel or the Jews may be behind them. He's uh, talking about uh, the West and its hatred of, of Turkish ways. And this apparently strikes a chord within many of his voters on the uh, on sort of on the religious and conservative uh, uh, side of the scale in Turkey, I think that's what works. And but I think it's also the fact that he controls the media. 
think about it. What can you say? I mean, how could people think otherwise when there's no other media? It seems that uh, his new friendship with uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, really affecting him in the, <laughs> uh, in the last uh, few months uh, or affecting his uh, decisions. He's learning a lot from him. Uh, Professor Zevi, thank you very much for this. Thank you. And uh, we're moving uh, now to Israeli elections. The Labour Party is voting today on a merger with the Tzipi's uh, Livni Hatnu'a party that was agreed upon last week. Meanwhile, on the right side of the political spectrum, it's all about splits and exchange of accusations between Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ori Shapira has the details. <laughs> A few days after the Labour Party leader Yitzhak Herzog and former Minister of Justice Tsipi Livni announced they will join forces, the political arena is still shaking. Members of the Likud Party sharply criticized Livni's appearance on Matzava Uma, an Israeli daily show style satirical program. She made some sarcastic remarks about her former ally, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, although her many critics think she may have gone too far. I thought it's better to get two prime ministers in rotation than one with impotence. Impotence, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Tsipi Livni allows herself to say despicable words against the Likud and Netanyahu. I don't want to think about the public mess that would arise if someone from the Likud or the right wing would have talked like that about Livni. Netanyahu also exchanged difficult wars with another former ally. Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman, who decided to end his alliance with the Likud party and run alone with his Israel Beitenu faction. After Lieberman announced he will not necessarily join the Likud in a future coalition, Netanyahu slammed him, saying a vote for Lieberman will strengthen the left wing. I respect and honor Prime Minister Netanyahu, but at the same time, I don't have any prejudice against any other candidate. More than three months until election day, the political map in Israel is still unclear. According to reports, Eli Shai, a leader of the ultra-Orthodox Shas party, which holds 11 seats in the parliament, is considering to leave the party and forming a new one that will include other politicians from different parties. With so many small parties around and others springing up almost every day, it's no wonder that the Israeli public is so confused. And just a short while ago, a meeting was held in Tel Aviv to uh, evaluate and expected that the, the merger of the, the Labour and Hatnua party. Our correspondent, Shai Ben-Ari, is uh, there. It seems that uh, everybody agreed on everything so quickly that they're already arranging the chairs there. Yeah, uh, Lucia, it has come to an end after a unanimous d decision, as you said, uh, to basically authorize to confirm the merger of these two parties. We're talking, of course, about Labor and Hatnua, led by Tsipi Livni. In fact, the final list uh, will include no less than six spots for Hatnua in the Labor list, the new list, let's say, including the second spot for herself, the eighth spot for Amir Peretz, who's basically returning to his traditional political home. This as well as the 16th, the 21st, the 24th, and the 25th spot. So we're talking about six spots for a party that is currently worth only about four, which would only barely bring it into the parliament if it were running alone. Uh, a lot of people have been saying that uh, Tsipi Livni has really been shown uh, a very impressive negotiation skills. In fact, the uh, uh, political satire show, Mitzvah Uma, or State of the Nation in, in English, joked that if uh, Livni had showed these kinds of skills in uh, negotiations with the Palestinians, perhaps Israel would be in a much better situation. But, you know, that's, uh, that's the political humor here in Israel. Yes, uh, definitely. Shai ben uh, Yeah, she's good. Maybe she needs to change. No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, Shai ben thank you uh, very much uh, for this. And uh, let's go to uh, something else. The UN Climate Summit closed uh, in Lima, Peru today with an historic agreement that urges members of other countries to set a framework to reduce carbon emissions within a few months. But some groups are calling the deal too weak. I-24 News reporter Uri Shapira has more. It took longer than expected and happened in overtime, but the UN members who participated at the Lima Climate Change Conference finally reached an agreement. It seems to me, and I'm sure that we are all ready to take on the challenge of approving this document. And if that is the case, and I don't hear any objection, the text is approved. The document calls for an ambitious agreement in 2015 that reflects the different responsibilities and respective capabilities of each nation and urges developed countries to provide financial support to vulnerable developing countries. Reaching the agreement was not an easy task. 
and up until the last moment, it was uncertain whether it could be achieved as the Chinese representative clashed with the American one and refused to sign the paper. We take the view that the current draft project needs to be amended further in order to reflect the differences between the developed and developing countries. Despite the obstacles, the conference ended successfully. However, not everybody was satisfied. This is an incredibly weak text. The parties have just clapped through something that is going to lead to all voluntary submissions of information. And the big picture is, when they're done, it's going to be very hard to know if we're actually able to avoid dangerous climate change or not. Terms like global warming and the greenhouse effect may sound strange to many, but the truth is these issues affect every one of us. The Lima conference may be a small step toward a much cleaner and healthier world. But some think the damage that has been done is irreversible and there is little that can be done to save our planet. And with me in the studio is Neta Achitov, environmental journalist for Hearts Daily Newspaper. Good evening. Thank you very much for Good coming. Evening. On the paper, it seems like an amazing deal. Yes. That we're not going to die after all. <laughs> but we are going to die, but it is an amazing deal. <laughs> but it is an amazing deal. Yes. How realistic is it? It's quite realistic. After 20 years of negotiation, actually, all of the countries agreed on something because the last uh, deal was in Tokyo, it was 1997, and only the rich countries had to do something about climate change, and the poor countries, which is uh, Brazil, China, India, you We're know, countries that have a lot of emissions, they, you know, they weren't, by the committee wasn't binding for them. Also Israel, for example, wasn't supposed to do anything. Now all the countries has to do something. They have six months to show what they are going to do, their plan, and then the UN will rate them and say if it's okay and if it's... So how, how in six months you just change your entire way of life in one way or another in some countries? Yeah, it's not an entire change because many countries are already on the path oh, yeah. there. Also Israel has a plan to reduce 20% of its emission by 2020. We're not yet even close, but we do have a plan. So it's, you know, it, we can do it if we just want to. And it's really nice that all the countries actually agree on something. And it's, you know, it's the step before the Paris uh, committee that will be in 2015, which everybody is looking forward to it. Exactly. When you're saying it's it's like the committee before the committee. So it's yeah. the agreement before the agreement, yeah. which will be the next agreement, what? That they will agree on another agreement that will be signed in another no, six months? No, in Paris, all the leaders will be there and will sign. Now it was like a pre committee to you know um, you know prepare the ground for the leaders and it was really professional people now meeting for two weeks which is a long time actually they had to their deadline was Friday but they released a, the agreement only today this morning so they did take you know all the time they needed to get a really good deal you're saying that they took all the time that they uh, need but uh, you know like we said on the paper it seems that everybody yeah. is committed can you uh, re? Can you fix it? Can no. you fix the damage? <laughs> no, the um, like the you know people who are against it, they say that the, it won't help because we are supposed to reduce two degrees Celsius and we are supposed to go back to the pre-industrial times, and we are not going to get there by this agreement. We're going to get half the way, but it's a start. It's a beginning, and what is really nice about it is that the first time there is actually like think it's a worldwide agreement there is nothing like that there was never something like that ever I, because you know when we're seeing these pictures and it seems that the damage that we already done to the world yeah. is irreversible so it, what the least that the world can do is right now is to try to not make more damage this is the deal basically yeah it's to reduce emissions from coal especially coal I think in 10 years we won't see anything that is um, you know running on coal uh, gas and oil and and to move into renewable energies, there are actually ways, you know, technology is, we are there already. We just need to change it and to make it economically, you know, efficient. So at least like you're saying, to keep the situation as it is right now exactly. for more and more years. Yeah, so this could be also good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Monday will mark uh, one year since the beginning of the current conflict tearing apart South Sudan, the world's newest nation where two million people have been uprooted. Here's their story. This church, once a sanctuary for the residents of Bor, became a gravesite earlier this year when over 40 people were brutally massacred here. There was just one survivor, an old blind woman still traumatized by the sounds of death. 
They found me here and pulled me into the compound where they were killing people. There were many people and they started killing. I heard the bullets. I think God saved me. One year later in South Sudan remains locked in a bloody civil war, with the December 15th killings in Juba having set off a cycle of retaliatory violence across large swaths of the country. President Salva Kiir and his rival, former Vice President Riyak Mashar, have agreed on a string of deals and ceasefires, but all have collapsed within days. Many doubt the violence will end anytime soon. We have to fear for the worst. We have to fear that we will continue to see abuses and we will continue to see a really dangerous, a really frightening rift between the two largest ethnic groups in South Sudan. The conflict has taken on a bitter ethnic dimension, with the Dinka people of Kir fighting the Noor of rebel chief Mashar. The international crisis group estimate that at least 50,000 people have been killed, while some suggest it could be double that. Half the country, six out of 12 million people, now need aid, while nearly two million people have fled their homes in the fighting. The older generation has known little but war, and the youth face mass joblessness in a country awash with guns. After a year of conflict in the world's youngest country, that dream appears ever further away. And we're back to Israel to some uh, good news to some people. The more this uh, morning, Israeli government ministers unanimously, unanim 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 okay, it's not going to work out, approved a new IDF chief of staff, General Gadi Eisenkot Netanyahu, described him as the right man in the right place at the right time. The 54-year-old general will replace current chief of staff, Lieutenant General Benny Gantz, in mid-February. He has been serving for the past two years as his deputy, unanimously, yes. And now to economy. <laughs> no. Okay, so we don't, not yet, okay. It was uh, just uh, last Friday near Jerusalem that a Palestinian uh, uh, targeted an Israeli family in an accident uh, attack, including a mother and her three young daughters and niece. Several of the family members were lightly wounded along with the, hitch, uh, with the hitchhiker. Attack, I-24 News, Elsa Morgus has more. An Arab came, the terrorist. I saw him coming. I saw him coming, but I did not suspect him. I did not. I was hitchhiking and I was busy asking a driver where he was heading. And he came on my right side. He asked me what time it is, and then he threw a glass of acid at me. We don't know precisely what kind of acid, whether it contained caustic soda or not but I got it directly in the eyes. At that moment, I tried to run away. Of course, at first I was totally blinded. The pain was pretty intense in the eyes, and my breathing was rather painful. Yes, today marks uh, two years since the shocking shooting at an elementary school in Sandy Hook, uh, uh, Sandy Hook Connecticut. On uh, that day, 20-year-old Adam Lanza stormed at the school and killed 20 young children, six school employees, and his mother. Parents of several of the murdered students are set to announce on Monday a lawsuit against uh, Bushmaster, the North Carolina-based manufacturer of the gun used by Lanza. And now to economy. And with me is economy reporter uh, for the Jerusalem Post, Neve Ellis. Good evening. Good evening. I just wanted to move before and it just. I know, it's in. very exciting when I'm here. Just yeah, want to get right to why, it. Yeah, I just wanted to just <laughs> speak right. about. The, Who isn't excited about the economy? That's what I want. Uh, we're know. always excited about economy, especially when it's connected to the United States. And the Senate approved the budget. <laughs> Finally, isn't it great news? Which is which is a surprise? Was it a surprise? Because for me, it sounded like because I thought that Barack Obama is going to have a hard time. You know, he did have a hard time. He always has a hard time, and I think there's actually a little bit of a glimmer of hope in the fact that they approved this. Like happened last year, there was a chance that the budget. Uh, was going to fall and the government was going to shut down. I don't know if you remember, but last October, the U.S. government shut down for 16 days because they weren't able to agree on a budget or even continuing the debate over the budget. This time, they did manage to come together. And part of the reason that it passed was because, A, Obama stepped in and actually did some lobbying in Congress, which he usually hasn't been very good at doing. And even though there were sort of some um, opposition from both the left and the right who didn't want the bill to go through. Mm -hmm. The most 
the majority of the people decided that they weren't ready for another shutdown, which is a good thing that they're saying, you know what, even if we can't get our way, we want the government to stay open and operate. And now it seems that all the powers, like you said, are gathering up that these things, that actually there won't be another shutdown mm -hmm. because it's affecting basically the economy of the United States. What does it actually mean right now for Barack Obama? Well, I think that it, it actually means more for the greater political system than for Obama. One of the reasons is that we see sort of the left hardening. We had Elizabeth Warren, who is a, a hardcore liberal senator, who was really against a provision, not a very good provision that ended up passing, which would let the government continue to bail out bankers over swaps. Um, so that's something that she really didn't want, a loosening of regulation. That was sort of a win for Wall Street. But she really came out strongly against it, and so did Pelosi, the, um, the minority leader in the House, who's also a big liberal bastion. On the right, you had Senator Ten Ted Cruz from Texas, who's also a presidential hopeful from the right, who came in and really tried to scuttle the whole thing over Obama's immigration plans. And you see these two sides really s digging in their heels. But I think, once again, the hopeful thing is that everyone else in the center decided we're going to move forward even if it's not perfect. So does it, what does it mean, this budget right now, to the people who are working 9 to 5? I think what it means is that, again, when you don't have the government shutting down, when you have a little bit more faith that the government's going to do what it's going to have to do, the U.S. government has lost a lot of credibility in the last couple of years because of the shutdowns, because of debates over whether it's even going to pay back the bills it's supposed to pay, about whether it's going to be a responsible government. So in this situation, you know, it really lends legitimacy to the government and its policies, and that's something that really affects the economy because people know that the government is going to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. It seems that, that uh, I almost said Benjamin Netanyahu. It seems that uh, Barack <laughs> Obama is trying to look more on in the inside than on uh, the outside. Yeah. This is what. The interesting thing is that the Republicans are going to be taking over the Senate in January. So this was sort of the last ditch effort of the Democrats in the Senate. Um, so the question is, how is it going to change? Is this going to be the, a last glimmer of hope or a first glimmer of hope? Maybe it's going to be a new era of cooperation between the Democrats of and the Republicans. We can always dream, can't we? we? <laughs> this is why we're here to dream. To dream. Yes. Steve <laughs> Bells, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Exit polls show Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's ruling coalition winning elections by a landslide. Abe called the election two years early to obtain a French mandate, a fresh mandate for his financial strategy. More from Ayman Siksik. We had a goal as coalition to take the majority of the seats, so I'm relieved that we have managed to continue our ruling coalition. But at the same time, this is also a great responsibility. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe sailed through to a predictable win in elections on Sunday, following a snap poll to boost support for his economic reforms. The win came despite a report published last week showing that Japan's economy was in far worse shape than previous estimates had shown. This could very well be the reason for the remarkably weak voter turnout, signaling that the public sees the premier's move as opportunistic, designed only to prolong his reign past his four-year term. I came to the polling station with hopes that this election helps boost the economy, which is bad now in bringing a brighter future for my son. Abe was elected in 2012 on promises to revive the Japanese economy. Turnout had hit a remarkable low then too, with just under 60% of eligible voters casting their ballots. In an attempt to improve public opinion, Abe decided last month to put off a second tax hike of 10% until April 2017. But the decision quickly backfired as it raised concerns over how the country will curb its public debt, the worst debt among advanced nations. According to analysts in Japan, Sunday's win is likely to see Abe re-elected again next September. If he wins the September election, Abe will have defeated widening criticism of his reign and become one of Japan's rare long-term leaders. And out of sports. And with me now is sports reporter Michael Friedman. Good evening. Good evening. Let's talk Bundesliga. Bayern Munich. Okay. Underlining another superiority. They are the best team in the Bundesliga. They won another great match, 4-0 at Augsburg. Not an easy place to, to go away. Uh, early on, actually in the 58th minute in the second half, you had a brilliant header by Mehdi Benatia. 
brilliant goal. He's <laughs> yeah, 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 very he's strong. Okay. Um, then Arjun Robin, great goal. Just beat the keeper in the yeah. outside. Not a chance. He's the star player. Yeah, he's he he was always the star. Always. It's not Lewandowski, another great player, had a goal. Beat beat the keeper inside. And it really it was just easy for them in the second half. Uh, Robin fi finished it off. He had four men surrounding him, but really there's there's no stopping to a team like that. Till when he's supposed to continue playing, Robin? Robin, surprisingly, he doesn't age a bit. I remember him back when he was at Chelsea, and now, years later, he's still a superstar. Um, he's got such, such talent, and age, he's quite fortunate. Okay, so let's. Uh, what is the latest with Adrian Patterson? So we all know Adrian Peterson got himself in a little trouble. Um, he's currently a little. little trouble with the uh, domestic violence on the NFL. He's in a suspension and he's serving his time and not playing. And now he's saying that I think I'm going to go and run in the Olympics. Mm. So this is something that he's had thought about in the past it's been you know a goal of his in, in uh, his life and he said in 2012 he's hoping for uh, you know he said to ESPN that I'm gonna one day run in the Olympics so now that he has this time off why not give himself the chance to uh, focus, be, on focus on running because he is arguably yeah. the best and fastest runner in the, the NFL Just before we're finishing who's jumping uh, in London into the water so, so I don't know about you but I certainly don't want to be jumping in the water right Me now either. it's four mm -hmm. degrees Celsius in London you had about 400 uh, crazy people jumping in the water um, some were you know in the Christmas spirit wearing Santa hats uh, others were wearing furry gorilla or Viking <laughs> Uh, costumes. I personally don't think that warm kept Christmas them any warmer. Spirit, this is how you call this is it, how like you call it in London. Oh my God! Can't get me in that water. People are a little bit bored, I think, in this place of the world. Crazy. Michael, crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much for this. Thank you. And we're going out for a small break, two minutes, and then I'll be back for the daily debate.